If y'all don't mind, um, if y'all want to mute yourself and then Shannon's going to start or she's already started the recording. I'm going to pray. And then after I pray, we're going to go ahead and do the video. So at that point, if you don't mind turning your video off so we can all see. And Andy's going to play the video for us. Um, and then that way we can all still participate and be involved. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us here together tonight. And I just pray that um, as we look at week three and we um, hear from uh, Gina tonight, that you will um, help us to hear the things that you would have us to hear and that our heart needs to hear. And as we um, discuss um, what you have been teaching us through your word and through this study um, from this past week, I pray that you will help us to be you know, um, open listeners and have an open heart to hear what you're trying to say to us. And as each lady shares their heart, I pray that you'll help us to be receptive to what they are saying and sharing. And Father, I just ask that you go with um, us as we um, have our study tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So if everybody will mute and take your video off, we will get started. As we begin today's session, let's open up with a word of prayer. Well, welcome to week three of the free study, a part of the Living Deeper series of discipleship studies. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this next week as we jump into more and more of this uh, freedom uh, quest that God has us on, uh, defining freedom as the releasing of oneself to the purposes of God, uh, like a dandelion in the wind, like a soaring eagle, that's what freedom can look like for me and you. And it's what Jesus came to give us. It is for freedom that he set us free. And we want to go after that freedom. We want to understand we already have it. And we want to learn how to maintain it and live in it. And so I hope you enjoyed this week's study. Um, this week we talked about fear. And um, if there's any kind of insidious uh, um, um, thing that has kind of infiltrated our lives. It's fear. I believe it's one of the uh, biggest things the enemy uses to, uh, to keep us from fulfilling our purposes, to not walking in who God made us to be and not knowing our identity and what salvation brought for us. I believe it is this spirit of fear. And uh, so on day one, we talked about fear and we actually talked about um, that fear comes from being wounded in our soul. When someone wounds us uh, and, and bruises our hearts or bruises our soul, we talked about how even though a bruise doesn't look because it's not bleeding on the outside, ble uh, bruising is bleeding up under the skin. And many times we are bleeding, we are hurting up under the skin and nobody else may see it, but it is still happening. So we talked about that. And then on day two, we talked about Jesus was bruised. The Bible says he was bruised for us. He was bruised for our iniquities. And so we talked about what that bruising looked like for Jesus and how that brought us freedom. And that, and that freedom from fear brought the freedom to receive the love of God and trust in the love of God, which was so good. 
And then on day four, we talked about Hagar. Um, we talked about Hagar and her child Ishmael. We talked about how Sarah rejected and wounded and bruised Hagar. And how even in the midst of that, she would name Ishmael, her son, the Lord has seen my misery. And that's so good. He's seen my bruising. And so we see out of her life how God redeemed the hurt. God redeemed the bruising in her life. And she overcame the fear that she was experiencing from that bruising. And then on day five, again, the counterfeit. The enemy wants us to remain in the spirit of fear so that we will not attain the freedom that Jesus came to give us and how that looks. And we actually uh, spoke, declared, and prayed and asked God to deliver us, to free us from the spirit of fear. Just as when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, God said, I will deliver you from it. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to get you out of it. Um, we must be delivered, pulled out, plucked out from these things that hold us hostage to our freedom. And so I hope you enjoyed that. Now, today, I want to just, I, I just want to share with you uh, one thought um, that comes out of 1 John 4.18. 1 John 4.18 says that the perfect love of God cast out all your fear. I think many times for us, if somebody were to say, well, what's the opposite of fear? We would say the opposite of fear is faith or the opposite of fear is courage. But in reality and scripturally, the Bible says the opposite of fear is love. So as you think about, well, how is the opposite of fear love? Let me explain it to you the way I've come to understand that. If I'm afraid, Let's say I'm afraid that my children are going to be hurt if they run out in the street. Then let's say I'm in my house and I'm cooking dinner and my kids say, well, can we go outside and play until you um, finish dinner? In my fear, I would say, oh, no, what if they go out in the street and they get run over? And so, no, y'all have to stand by me. You have to put your arms around both legs. One over here and one over here, and I'm going to cook, and y'all have to stand right here because I'm too afraid to let you go outside because you might go out in the street and you might get run over, okay? So what has happened is because of our fear, we're taking action. We're trying to control things, and there is no freedom for our children. Our children are not experiencing the freedom of going outside and playing. They're missing out on that freedom. They're in the bondage to hanging on to my legs because of my own fear. See, fear is about control. Fear is a, causes us to try to control things. And yet, if you look at love, the reason love is the opposite of fear is because fear, uh, fear is about control and taking, okay? Love is about freedom. Love is about giving. I love you enough and I trust God enough that I'm going to allow you to go outside and I'm going to ask you and set the parameters around our house to say, don't go out in the street, okay? Um, but I'm going to give you the freedom to go outside. Just don't go out in the street because it's dangerous. And, I'm, and, and that's a loving thing. Whereas freedom, uh, fear can cause us to control and then we take from their freedom and now they're feeling like they're in bondage. And I think all of us can say where we've experienced fear and, and tried to control things and where fear has controlled us. And so such a great week and so much that we have to understand about fear and love. I will step out far enough to say that you will never fully experience freedom until you truly understand and realize the love of God. Um, listen, I say this to people all the time, and it's so grammatically incorrect, but I know the love. I have such a confidence and a stability in the love of God that I'm not afraid of anything. Amen? I, I mean, man, I, I say it like this. I'm not afraid of nothing. You know, uh, I, but listen, listen, the love of God, when you know God loves you and he has a plan for your life, you will fly into the storm like we talked about last week and you will, you will walk in such a freedom because you know God loves you and you don't have to be afraid of anything because he's always going to be with you and he's going to 
uh, turn that thing to good, to great purposes, if you love him and you're called according to his purposes, Romans 8, 28. And so there is no fear in, when you know the truth and the depth of the love of God. But here's the problem. Many of us cannot imagine that the love of God is given as freely as it is. I mean, you do realize that uh, freedom is based on love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. See, see everything that all that we have, all the freedom that we have, all the forgiveness that's been given, it was all motivated out of love. Romans, Romans uh, 5, 8, but God demonstrated, he showed his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, everything has been motivated out of a heart of a love for us. And so that's how we can know that this love is real. But we had such a hard time believing that someone could just so freely love us like that because we've really never experienced someone freely loving us without some kind of attaching uh, something to it or some demand with it. It's always been conditional love. And so it's hard for us to grasp. And let me just tell you this. You will never be able to behave beyond what you believe. In, in other words, if you will never behave like a much much loved child if you don't believe you're a much loved child but if you know down in the depths of your being i'm not talking about just knowing i'm talking about you know that you are a much loved child of the most high god he is your father he's your abba daddy when you know that you are a much loved child you behave like a much loved child and you're not afraid of anything and so that's where God wants us to be. It's what he designed for us to be. He did not want us to live in fear. That's why the word of God says in Timothy, God I did not give you a spirit of fear, but he gave you a spirit that's got power and love and a sound mind. It's all about the, what God's love will keep you from fear. Um, I wrote something down here that I want to share with y'all. If you have never experienced um, love, uh, unconditional love from those around you, it's very likely that you will take what you have experienced love to be and project that onto God. And that's why we have such a hard time believing that God can really just freely love us like that. With our, you know, with our flaws and our warts and our insecurities and all that, we we struggle with that because we've never experienced that. For instance, many times, uh, based on how your earthly daddy loved you, will be you will project that on the, uh, the Trinity part of the Father. So you want if, if so if your earthly daddy was harsh, then you think that God is harsh. You see what I'm saying? Uh, when when it comes to your friends or your siblings. You will project how they loved you onto the son, Jesus. Okay? Jesus is your brother in Christ. Jesus is your groom. Jesus is your co-heir. You're a co-heir with Christ. And so we will many times, the way we were treated by our siblings or by our friends, project that onto the son. And then our mothers are that nurturing side of us. And that is what we would, if we didn't have a good mother, we, we had a cold mother or a harsh mother or a rejecting mother or a demanding mother, then we will kind of project that onto the Holy Spirit. See the Holy Spirit, that nurturing motherly side of God. And so you can see how if we haven't experienced it on in the earth, We'll have a hard time understanding and receiving that in the spirit. Now, let me tell you something. In the word of God, um, all of those things are important to us because the father God gives us our identity. The son helps us understand our inheritance. And our the mother, the Holy Spirit, shows us the value of our dependence over our independence. So these three things speak to us about identity inheritance and independence we're to live completely dependent on the holy spirit completely dependent on god's will and not our own as we learned last week so listen to this john 10 and 10 says what the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but i the good shepherd have come to give you life freedom and to give to you abundantly so here's what i want you to understand 
the enemy tries to steal your inheritance. He tries to kill your dependence on the Holy Spirit, and he tries to destroy your identity. He is coming against the three things that the Trinity's love gives you. Because of God's love, the Trinity offers you these things. And what is the enemy coming against but the very three things? And so he will even twistedly use, deceitfully use your mother, your father, your siblings, or your friends to distort God's love. And then you'll project that on him. And then you won't believe that he can just love you because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, because you've never experienced it. And if you don't believe that, you can't behave beyond that. You, you will never know the freedom from fear if you don't know the love of God. And so uh, in closing, you know, we, we can even go to uh, 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 Revelation. And we can see where the Bible talks about um, the different churches. And you were doing all these great things, but here's the one thing I had against you. And in Revelation chapter two, we were talking about uh, to the church of Ephesus. He says, this is the one thing I had against you. You've forsaken your first love. You've forsaken me. You've forsaken it. You've it was offered you, but you've walked away from your first love. And what did he tell us in that scripture to do um, to get back to our first love. He said, remember, remember the heights from which you've fallen. Remember what it's like to have a loving, walking, talking relationship, intimacy with the Father. Remember, then it said, repent. Listen, every time that you begin to remember, reflection of, of things moves your heart. Um, I, I wrote it down like this, and I love this. Reflection in your mind brings repentance to your heart. So you remember, and that reflection brings you to repentance. I'm so sorry. I want to turn from the way I've been heavy and get in the right direction of walking with you in love. And then repeat. Go back and repeat the things you used to do when you had this intimate, growing relationship with God. So if you find yourself filled with fear, um, uh, being attacked by the spirit of fear, and we talk about how to renounce that and rebuke that and and be, have, find some deliverance from that in the study. But if you have found yourself in the sphere, let me encourage you to, that, that it, it's, a, it's a deficit in love of not understanding the true love, the depth of love God has for you. And I would encourage you to remember, to repent, and to repeat. Now, let me, I told you every week I would have something about an eagle. So let me close with this uh, fact about eagles. You know, I've talked to you um, about eagles learning how to fly. And I talked to you about how eagles, uh, uh, the eagle will take the eaglet's nest and he'll put rough things underneath it and the soft stuff on top. And, the, and so they'll be comfortable. And then the, he'll start stirring the nest up, get rid of the comfortableness. And now it's rough. And so that eaglet's like, ooh, I want to get out of this nest. Well, when he jumps out of that nest, he starts plummeting to the ground, right? Because he hasn't exercised his wings. He doesn't know how to fly yet. And so he, fl he starts pl plummeting to the ground. Well, guess what? The, the eagle comes, flies up under, and, and bears that little eaglet up on eagle's wings. That's why the scripture says, I will bear them up, okay? So he takes them up on eagle's wings, all right? And so, so as soon as he takes that eaglet back up, he takes the eaglet back up, puts it in the nest. Then he takes it and jumps it out, dumps it out of the nest again, and there it goes, plummeting to the ground. And then that uh, eagle comes up, bears him up, ca catches him puts him back in his nest, and they continue to do it over and over again until that eaglet learns how to fly. Now, stay with me. This is what I want you to hear today. You have got to know, like if you just put yourself in an eaglet's position, you've got to know that the first couple of times that your daddy knocked you out of the nest because it was so uncomfortable, you got out of the nest, he, knocked, he drops you from the nest, and you're plummeting to the ground, that you are flailing all over the place, and you are consumed with fear. But after about three or four times of you falling and flailing down and experiencing the, the love of your daddy coming up under you, picking you up, putting you back in there, and y'all doing it again, you will begin to find such trust in the love of your father 
to always catch you, to always carry you back up to the higher heights. That once you begin to understand and trust that love and find such confidence in that love, then you no longer fall out of the nest or, or jump out of the nest or are thrown out of the nest and begin flailing. You begin to figure out how to fly. And that's where the Lord, the Spirit of God, is carrying you and carrying me as we get freed from fear. That though things come and though fear may ensue and try to come against you and take you back into bondage, you can say, I trust, I know the love of God, and I'm not afraid of anything. And I know that if fear tries to come against me, I know I have a father who loves me enough that he's going to come up under me. He's going to bear me up. He is going to carry me and lift me up uh, through this to higher heights, to greater places with him, in him, with his presence, in his presence, his presence in you to empower you to get through the storms of life, to get through the things that are difficult and teach you, help you exercise those wings to learn how to just throw them out and stem those wings and learn how to fly that's what freedom looks like and that's what freedom from fear looks like and that's what god has for you and i freedom it's releasing us from fear so that we can fulfill the purposes of god Okay, if everybody wants to come back on, yeah. there you are. Um, I like when she, in the video, I know she touches on points from the week you know, kind of goes back and gives a little synopsis of each day, but I like how she adds to it um, when she does the video, and of course, what stuck out to me tonight was when she started talking about revelation and forsaking your first, you know, that the church in Ephesus had forsaken its first love. That was in Andy's sermon Sunday, um, and talking about repentance um, and I like the way that she brought out the remember, repent, and repeat. Um, that kind of helps you uh, know the order there um, of what you're supposed to do. The reflecting in your mind, the remembering part, and then um, bringing repentance to your heart and repeating what you did when you were in that good relationship with God to come back to him and your first love. So I thought that was really good. For the video part tonight anybody have anything that stuck out with you with the video that you would like to share so um i'm a slacker who hasn't read all of my days this week so i don't know if this was video talk or if this was covered in the days because i've only done the first two but she talked about how there's no fear in the love of god and it just made me think that people don't understand the freedom that you have when you don't fear because it's in God's hands. And I thought back to um, the first time our house was broken into. I had left that morning. I left my cell phone. I almost came back and got it. And, I, and God's like, you're going to camp. You don't need a phone for the day. You'll be fine. And I was like, okay, I don't need the phone. If I had turned around and come back, I'd have walked in on the people breaking into my house which could have been really, really bad. But God told me, you don't need the phone. Just go about your day. It's going to be okay. Well, then I got home because they broke in the back. There was a note from the police officer on the front of the house. No big deal. I walk in, TV's gone. Computers, gone. everything's gone. Everything's gone. Um, they probably came in and out multiple times during the day because nobody 
came, nobody contacted, the phone was gone, everything's gone. Um, of course, I had that initial freak, that initial panic. I called the police station, but by the time they had the officer got there, God and I had already had it out, if that makes any sense. And God had said, you're alive. Your children are alive. Your pets did not run out of the back of the house and they are all still alive. You didn't come back to get your phone because I didn't, I told you not to. And it's all stuff that can be replaced. So by the time the officer got there, I was at peace with the fact that my house had been broken into. And the officer was shocked that I was not panicking to the point that he even wrote in the police report that victim was so calm, we cannot rule out that she didn't break into her own house. Because if you don't have the peace of God, you don't understand it when you see it with somebody else. So yeah, that was just like, that just really stuck out to me that, you know, when, when a lot of people see that as a nonchalant attitude, like you don't care about the world because you're not freaking out over this situation, or you don't care about people because you didn't freak out about COVID or you didn't do this. And I'm like, God's got it. What else is there for me to do? You know, so. Thanks, Christy. And if anybody else, I mean, if you have something from the video or if you want to go ahead and just share something that spoke to you in any of the days, feel free to go ahead and share what you would like to. In day five, I really liked those verses that she told us to read, and I wrote, wrote them down, and I've been reading them every day. There's like, I think there's five or six of them, and they all talk about feel free of fear, and when I was a small child, apparently something happened that you know it happened, but you're not really sure it's that major big deal. But in delving with this this week, I realized that it was a big deal and it had colored my life and made it fearful. And when I confronted that, I just felt such a peace. And I have that peace now. And that's only through God's peace that you have that. I'm glad that he spoke to you that way this week too. And I, when I got to those uh, verses, I want to, you know, I want to write them down like one on each sticky note, one per sticky note and put them around and try to memorize them. Yeah, you know, that was what she challenged us to do with those uh, seven verses so there'd be one for each day of the week um, uh, day five was kind of heavy to me um, I don't know if it was because it was longer a little more involved but it did um, it was a little tough for me to get all the way through um, I did but um, I was doing day five last night and it was a little bit later than I normally start. And so I think that had something to do with it too. But um, on the wrap up for day five, you know, she always asked at the end of the chapter, you know, what was your takeaway for the week? 
And so I started looking back over my notes and things that I had underlined in the chapter, I mean, in the sec, the days. Um, and I had written down most of what I focused on this week was from day two. And um, that was the day that was Jesus bled for that to redeem your wounds. And so as a, I guess, a takeaway, I had written the reason for Jesus's suffering was his immense love for me. I need to live in freedom of being worthy and not in fear. I need to use God's word to help me resist and overcome the lies of the enemy. And as an action step, you know, I do want to memorize or at least read daily, like Beverly said, those seven verses um, to kind of combat fear in, in my life. And then this morning, the U version verse of the day, I put it in the, the messenger chat earlier, was um, the resist the devil and he will flee from you verse that she had brought up in day five. And so, um, you know, relating to that and relating, you know, back to sermons from last week, I mean, God is definitely, you know, speaking um, to me in different ways because, you know, that seems to happen. It's kind of confirmation when you hear it from several people or you see it in several different uh, venues or, you know, anything like that. That's a, that's a reason to pay attention to um, what God's saying, but um, day two, um, I can't remember what page, day two starts on page 67, but um, trying to find the part, I was talking about Jesus's um, suffering, you know, and that he was crushed and broken for us, and one thing that just really um, stood out was um, God allowed Jesus to suffer so that we could return to our place in relationship with him. I mean, that was the point and that we are fully known and fully loved by God. And so we have complete acceptance and total belonging. And, you know, she brought up the point um, that the scripture had said 53 that scripture says that he was satisfied Jesus and God were satisfied and so in other words he said it was so worth it and I never really thought of that part of that verse as meaning that so that will to me this week I also um, got a lot out of day two. Um, so when Kim was talking, I was wondering if she was going to take what I was looking at just now. But, um, you know, you, you hear sermons about how the three gifts that the wise men brought Jesus had a symbolism for his life. But I never knew about the myrrh um, until I read this um, this week about how um, myrrh is more fragrant. fragrant um, uh, how did she say it? it when the plant when it's crushed the more crushing that happens the more fragrant it becomes and um christy probably doesn't even realize this but she put something on facebook i can't remember i think it was today about grass and how she likes the smell of grass and <laughs> But basically, this, I didn't know this either, so Christy educated me on this. Grass puts out that smell as a way to try to, like, survive from being cut. So basically, she said she likes the smell of murder. So, um, but it just kind of, it just kind of struck me as funny when she posted that, because I immediately thought of day two in the myrrh. And, you know, I, I'm sure you guys have, ladies have known people like this, but you meet these women who seem like, they've got it all together and they're the, just so kind and loving and you look at them and you're like, man, I want to be just like them. And then you hear their story and their story is, you know, a lot of times they have a tragic story or something that's happened in their lives that has devastated, would be devastating, but yet 
they are such kind and loving women. And, you know, it's because they've learned to be broken and to allow God's sweet aroma to come through them. And just as I was reading day two, that was just my prayer that, you know, as God brings things into my life, that I'll allow him to bruise me and break me and not become bitter, but become that sweet smell that he's trying to produce in me. So um, whether that's myrrh or grass, whichever, but um, <laughs> that's what I, I just really stood out to me about day two. Um, I was in that same area. Um, mine, I think what struck me was uh, the, about the bruising. Um, it's, um, I underline the more bruised, the more beautiful, the more fragrant. Jesus was bruised for us so that a beautiful fragrance of healing, acceptance, and belonging could be ours. And our bruises can be a beautiful fragrance to do the same for others. And I thought that that was really good. And, um, you know, different times in my life where I've experienced tragedy or um, just difficult times, I've always had the peace that God was, um, if I didn't understand or didn't know why, um, I was going through that particular trial or whatever was that um, somehow in some way I would be able to minister to others who may be going through the same thing. And, um, and that just was a beautiful way of putting it. And I just really liked that. And it um, just reminded me, um, you know, how God uses things that are bruised or or broken, or I read a book one time about how, you know, God uses cracked pots because through the cracks is where Jesus shines through. And, um, you know, that makes it evident to others, um, even when you don't feel like you're worthy yourself. So um, anyway, I, I got out a lot out of day two as well. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay. Because my internet connection is not good and it's really rainy here. So I'll try. Y'all let me know if you can't hear me. Um, but uh, what she said in the video about the eagle, um, the eagle coming up under and bearing up the eaglet uh, really kind of fit in with how the Lord was speaking to me through this week. Um, and especially it was actually on day three, uh, about almost to the end, uh, where it says a bruised reed, he will not break. And though you find yourself bruised, he will not break you. Though you are bruised, you are not broken. And uh, <clears throat> this is actually this verse, uh, which I think is in Isaiah, uh, about a bruised reed, he will not break. Uh, it's actually one I had been praying for my kids, you know, they've been through a lot of trials, all three of them. And, uh, you know, just trusting in the Lord that <clears throat> he's going to help them through it. He's going to bear them up and he won't break them. <clears throat> but the Lord really spoke to me and said, you know, what about you? You know, are you trusting me that I will not break you? Um, you know, from all the trials that you've been in um, and maybe the trials, you know, when she talked about fear of the future, you know, that's something I deal with because I have had a lot of trials. And uh, so, you know, that's something that the Lord has been working with me on this, you know, through this chapter um, about trusting, you know, like she, and I thought it was great how she talked about, you know, the first few times, you know, the eaglet must have been filled with a lot of fear. But, you know, as he saw, <clears throat> excuse me, as he saw the eagle bear him up, you know, um, he began to, to understand the love, you know, uh, and the strength and, you know, what the eagle was doing. And so, you know, just in all of this, you know, especially what she 
talked about remembering your first love, going back and remembering, and also remembering how the Lord has been the one there to bear you up. Um, so I just think it's a, it's a great reminder um, and something to really think about, you know, to stand in faith and say, yes, Lord, I believe that you're going to bear me up, you know, no matter what I'm going through now, no matter what the future holds, uh, whatever it may be, you're going to bear me up. I got so much out of this chapter. I may have to go back and reread it again and let it just sink in. It's, it's hit home with me on so many different levels. But I think on day one, uh, she said that um, I think we all have a strong desire to be fully known, full, to be full known and fully loved. The enemy is well aware of this. And three, the third thing she said was vulnerability, vulnerability, vulnerability vulnerability can be beautifully freeing while frightening frighteningly risky at the same time and just so much of this just hit so home to me and it made so much sense so i'm probably gonna have to just go back and reread this chapter and let it sink, sink in even further with me I think it's in day three, um, I have highlighted and starred a section where she wrote, um, what will be so amazing to you is that when you begin to fully trust the Lord, you will begin to develop the courage to be wrong, the courage to be imperfect, the courage to laugh at yourself, and the courage to grow and become the best that you can be. Uh, this last year has been a rough one, but in the process, I've learned I can't control everything and I have to give up some of that control. But also God has, taught, has given me peace. And knowing that I can't control everything and peace that I don't have to hold on to everything either. I don't think there was anything out of this whole week that did not stand out to me. Um, I think I got something from every day, but I think day three and day five were the two that really kind of stuck out for me. Um, on day three, um, where it says trust frees us to be vulnerable again, um, that really struck a chord with me because um, I have a hard time trusting people and especially opening up to people that I don't know, or I don't know how they will receive me or that kind of thing. Um, so that really kind of definitely stuck out at me um, and made me realize that there are areas that I definitely need to work on. Um, and then on day five, where she talked about all the different fears, the fear of rejection, fear of failure, um, fear of abandonment and fear of the future. I mean, wow. I don't think there was a single point out of any of that that I could not, um, that I couldn't relate to. Um, and like I said, I don't, this whole week has just been reading this, this whole week has just been amazing and it's been enlightening and it's just, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, it's just, it's wow. That's all I know what, how to say it. <laughs> it's amazing to me that every week, it seems like Satan puts up a reason for me not to log into this, not to show up, not to say something not to do something is this week this is not the first book we've done but this is like the first time this has ever happened like this is just so powerful this chapter's just been so painful for me a little bit and even tonight it's some of it's reminded me of how 
bruised I've been and just how much I've got to overcome with this. And it's just throwing it in my face. Exactly. That's how I feel, Kristen. Exactly. <laughs> well, kind of going with, with what y'all both are, are saying on, it's in day five. Um, on page 81, kind of about midway through, um, I had underlined and starred that constant fear was never God's intention for us. Yep. Satan loves to keep you in bondage to fear because fear will neutralize you and ever fulfilling your purpose. And if you never fulfill your purpose, then Satan has an inroad to neutralizing God's power and purposes on this earth through you. And that's why he attacks us um, because we're here to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. So, and he doesn't want that to happen. And, you know, every one of those fears that were, you know, mentioned that Alyssa said, the rejection, failure, abandonment, and fear of the future, you know, they're all relative and they're all in our lives. Um, and I made sure when I wrote those, kind of down in my notes that I put the scripture that she gave that goes, you know, combats each one of those fears down also. Um, because I wanted to remember, you know, and of course we need to know, you know, what the Bible says to those things. And um, yeah, that's what, yeah. When I got ready, when I was doing like uh, day five last night, it was like, Whoa, this is kind of heavy. Um, but good but it was heavy. And so I need to go back, like Kristen was saying, and kind of, um, I didn't really rush through day five, but I didn't spend quite as much time as I felt like I needed to because there was so much in it. So that might be something I need to do as well. I underlined something right under there also that stuck out to me right below where you just were. It says fear comes in various forms, but all in the effort of rendering you useless in the kingdom. Satan does not want you vulnerably sharing your gifts, talents, and calling with the world around you. He condemns you with shame and consumes you with the fear that you will be found out as one who doesn't have it all together. The truth is that none of us do. I thought that was so good because there's so many times where I feel like, um, you know, I could share with somebody, um, you know, certain parts of my life or things, you know, that I've gone through, but then that puts me in a vulnerable place. And I don't always want to go there, if you know what I mean. And I don't always want to be crying. <laughs> and I always feel like when, when I'm going into that mode of sharing my story or a story with someone, it puts me in that place of, I don't know, somehow I feel like it makes me weak. And, you know, as much as I know, that's not true. Um, it was, it was a good reminder and, and how she worded it and phrased it was just really good. Or it hit home to me. Well, and back on day one, um, she talked a lot about emotions and, you know, I'm a very emotional person and I try to squelch my emotions because once I start crying, that's it. I mean, it's going to keep going and going and going and it's ugly cry, um, you know, and um, I sometimes and I wrote, I kind of wrote a reflection. She asked you to reflect in your journal on emotions, I think is what it was. And so, um, you know, I said, I think if that I'm afraid that if I do show emotion, it will consume me and I won't be able to control it. And there's that ugly cry. Um, and then on March 20th, uh, that was what Saturday, because that's when I read day one. And so my part of my devotion that morning, it was a Max Licato devotion. Um, he said, tears represent the heart the spirit and the soul of a person to put a lock and key on your emotions is to bury part of your Christ likeness, especially when you come to Calvary and the cross, 
don't walk away from it dry eyed and unstirred. And, you know, I, I started thinking about, you know, I'll get emotional and cry at the drop of a hat reading a sappy novel or watching a movie. But how many times do I show that emotion, you know, during worship or, you know, during the important parts of my life? And, you know, so that was something that that's kind of how, you know, the week started. And then, um, you know, but it is hard. It's hard being vulnerable, especially to other people. Oh, God's still working on me on submission. And I think that's, you know, because uh, I have not submitted this week at all. Um, I was like, oh, I'm tired. I'll do it later. Oh, I'm tired. I'll do it later. Well, uh, later never came. But then I don't know how many of y'all read the big long paragraph I put on Facebook in the group right beforehand. But I got to thinking um, in Second Corinthians, the verse she had us read in day two, um, talked about how Christ grabbed us as captives and marched us into the city and we gave off a fragrance I was like captives marched into a city that just doesn't make any sense because you know you see like the medieval kings and they captured everybody and they put them in chains and they dragged them through for everybody to spit on them and do you know all of that stuff and then I got to thinking but that's they were being put into submission by those kings, but God's submission isn't that kind of a submission. You know, the, the being paraded in would have been something that the Jewish people would have been heard stories about from their days of Babylon and all of those things. But this is a different type of parade. And this is a parade in that, yes, you're in submission, but it's somebody you want to be a conqueror somebody that you want to submit yourself to, which is why it was a parade of fragrance. He doesn't chain you and tie you in. He, he chains you, he cleans you up, he fixes your wounds and says, I'm here as your conqueror, but I'm here as your conqueror to lift you, you know, like the eagle, to lift you up, to take care of you, not to bring you down, to release you from the bondage that you didn't even know you were in so I just thought that was an interest like that was an interesting way for God to bring that out because the image that we get of the conqueror is the chains and not the fragrance and the it was just very um ironic to me Would anyone else like to share anything from the week? Okay, well, we will go ahead since it is almost eight um, and Shannon will start putting us into um, our breakout rooms. And once you are um, done in your breakout room, you can leave the meeting and then we'll get back together.
Okay. I'm not sure Ashley hasn't joined. Ashley, are you able to join your breakout room? Her internet may not be working well enough. Okay. No, there we go. Okay, great. There we go. All right.